Six o'clock, I am calling this meeting to order. Please rise for the pledge. Jack, would you lead us in the pledge? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> Okay, thank you to everybody who is here. Got a good crowd. I uh, welcome, you know, guests at all of our meetings. Um, send us emails, phone calls. You know, we we want to have input from our community. I am going to assume that everybody had a chance to read the minutes from the last meeting. Are there any corrections, comments, or questions? Seeing none, does somebody want to make a motion to approve the minutes? Thank you, Lloyd. Is there a second? Second. <laughs> okay, Jennifer. Jennifer, thank you. It's been moved and seconded. Any discussion? All in favor of approving the minutes from the previous meeting, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passed unanimously. Uh, next up, board chair update. I feel like it's been a while since I've seen you. <laughs> so um, I, I do have some updates. Um, I've been in Helena a couple of times with MCSBA and meeting with some of the legislators, some of the same ones that we did here, um, and just talking about some things that are going on. So far, well, not so far. As of last week, there were 2012 bill drafts in, which is a huge amount this year. It's larger than it has been in the past, um, but a lot of them are just kind of placeholders you know, they'll fill in the blanks for them. But there's some things that we will probably want to watch, um, and I will try and keep you up to date on things and, and send out um, talking points about things and let you know if we should be giving some input and even um, testifying at some of the committee hearings. Um, there's some bills on open enrollment, on charter schools, um, school funding, you know, a lot of a lot of issues that we need to pay attention to. Um, so stay tuned on all that. Um, and I know that you have probably seen in the paper a lot um, about Chapter 55. Uh, the the Board of Public Ed did not accept all of OPI's recommendations. In particular. Um, they did not accept the recommendations to take away ratios for librarians, counselors, um, superintendents, and principals. Um, they kept those ratios in there. Um, and that was in large part due to a lot of public input. So that was um, pretty important, I thought. Um, and that is all I wanted to tell you about right now. Next up, uh, recognitions and reports. We have our student reports. And I know we've got, we have anybody from middle school? Yep. Okay. Bronson? Welcome. Hi. Uh, uh, yeah, like I said, uh, I'm Robinson uh, from KMS, an eighth grader at uh, So we are doing our annual KMS Food Drive this week. Uh, these proceedings will go to needy families at our school, and anything not donated will go to the Lion Club. Many of our students and staff have fulfilled their community service at being with wildfires and like food banks and stuff. And actually this Friday, we are holding a fundraiser for the students at our school that lost their phones to the fire. Fires. Uh, the 6th and 
seventh grade have had their first concert of the year, and the eighth grade will be having a combined concert of choir, orchestra, and band for a big holiday concert. Uh, we usually host a holiday dinner, but we haven't for two years, so that's back. The kitchen staff will be hosting with tacos and a salad bar to talk to salad. And we are having a talent show for any student that wants to participate. And we will be performing the musical Lion King in March at our school. And auditions will be held in January. Thank you. Any questions? Right. Thank you. Have a question. Yes. How many students at the middle school have lost their homes to fires? Um, there has been two that have lost their homes to Thank you for letting me speak, and feel free to come to us any time. Okay, Flathead. Hello, everyone. Um, for those who don't know, I'm Ivy Gannon. I'm senior class president. I'm Flathead. Um, November and December are pretty busy months for school, so we have a lot of good stuff. So this December is Service Project Month for Student Council. So we have lots of different activities that sort of focus on giving back and helping our students because this is a pretty hard month with school. So first off, we have the Motivation Foundation. So that's when a group of student council members dress up as like elves and Santa, and we give out hot chocolate in the commons during lunch. Um, and it just kind of helps students finish up school with high spirits, which is awesome. Uh, we also do the food drives with second period classroom. Uh, it's like a competition to see who can collect the most cans. And there's a prize for that, and then who can build the best structure. And sorry, but we flathead normally wins, and he's glacier in Canada. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, we also have the angel tree. We have you probably see them out in the comments in the hallway, but it's an angel tree and then the brave angel tree. So the angel tree, they have little tags on them that they like certain toys. So the Brave angel for the angel tree is for like children and uh, like elementary kids, and then the brave angel is students like half <coughs> head. So there's like clothing and other things that high schoolers might want or need. So make sure to go check them out in the hallway and in the commons. Uh, right after I think I talked to you guys, we had the veterans assembly, which went over super well, and we had a really amazing speaker. That was extremely moving, and the student body was very, very respectful. And overall, it was just a really great assembly. Theater has lots of stuff happening. They just had High School Musical, and sold out every night. And there were about 60 kids that participated. And it was a really awesome show. And tonight, they also have a production, The Christmas Princess, I think, tonight and tomorrow. So check that out. Uh, the music department, we had choir and orchestra concerts already. And I think the band concert is sometime this week. Um, so yeah, just a big month for everyone. We also had a bunch of sports that started. So basketball, wrestling, and swimming, and speech and debate. Uh, another major thing is art trek which Art Club went to Seattle the 30th of November through the 3rd. Um, the ferry ride was a highlight for a lot of people because you don't really get to ride on a ferry, so we on there. Uh, we visited the Mopop Museum and the Seattle Art, or Seattle Art Museum, and we got to walk around small art galleries around Seattle and talk to local artists, which was really awesome. We got to see the Chihuly Garden Glass, Museum, which was one of my favorites. It's really pretty. And we got to tour University of Washington Art Department, which was a really good experience, and I think a lot of people enjoyed that. We went to Pike Place Market, went on the Ferris wheel, and we finished up the trip with the Nutcracker Ballet. 
So very, very eventful. And there were about 40 students, both from Flathead and Glacier combined. And then we had four chaperones, which were the four art teachers. Uh, this was a really fun trip. We got to meet a lot of people. I usually, well, I my first time at art club, so I got to meet a lot of people that I don't really like hang out with at Flathead, which is really fun. And at Glacier, I got to meet a lot of people. And then one other major thing is something that we're doing this year called Sophomore Strength. Ms. Jane is sort of leading this. So with this, we have all the sophomore students tomorrow during second, third, and fourth period. Um, they'll be in the new gym, and they will be making medicine wheels all together. So Bray's mentoring the exec, the foundation leadership class, um, we had to make these since we were sort of um, also leading this to help the sophomores guide in some more mature little area. So I'll kind of show mine. So the first part is that we're doing heritage. So my heritage is Louisiana. That's where my mom's from. So we eat, like seafood and hot sauce. Um, and then we have to focus on a hurdle in our life, and I put anxiety for the students. And then we have to do happiness, and I put YAC and the Special Olympics and the kids that I help in the classroom. And then for hope, I put my future. Um, so I put college and sociology. Good brain. I so the sophomores will be making these medicine wheels, and it's sort of like a combination of art and Indian education, and also just like mental health. So the exact students for grade mentoring will be helping, and this is sort of like our grade mentoring we have for freshmen. It's just an extra little thing for the sophomores. They do it in. Other schools in Montana, I can't remember which one, but we're doing it here. So next meeting, I'll let you guys know how it goes. Any questions? Is this the first year you're doing the sophomore thing? Yes. But we were all like trained when we watched videos on how to like. How do you like being a responsible individual? Good. <laughs> <laughs> I try. My hardest. <laughs> okay, thank you guys. Thank, thank you, you Ivy. <clears throat> okay, next up, building updates from Hedges. And that is not going to happen tonight. Oh. Okay, never mind. Just some unforeseen circumstances. Okay, we we know all about that. So we will move right on to the Heart Locker Ambassador Program update, and we have Casey Driscoll here. Are you able to click on those slides for me? Okay. Hello, everyone. Thank you for having me. I'm Casey, I'm the Heart Program Director and our Families and Transitions Coordinator. So we're going to talk about some updates that we have at the Heart Locker, but we're going to focus primarily on our Ambassador Program, which is new. You see 1.1 million, I'll get us started. So 1.1 million, that is the number of students pre-K through 12th grade that we reported as a nation that are facing homelessness. And these are from 2020, 2021. Those are the most recent stats that we have right now. Um, so that's a, that's a pretty big number. And keep in mind that those are the students that we're actually able to concretely identify. So we might still even be missing some. And then just to give you an idea, if you're unfamiliar with the definition of McKinney Bento, that's how we identify homelessness for youth. It could be any of these situations here. So what we see most often is that they're doubling up or sharing housing of friends or family um, where the parent or guardian or the child themselves is not the person on the lease or the lease. 
Unfortunately, they can and sometimes are kicked out at a moment's notice. Um, could be living in a hotel or motel, could be living in a camper, situations like that. And yes, we do have students in our district that are living in campers, overcrowded apartments, they're living in all sorts of situations, sometimes cars, unfortunately, and of course, the shelters that we have here locally. Okay, so the impact of the pandemic, it did make it quite difficult to accurately report and identify because we did lose access to some of those students and families when we did do some remote learning. Um, so we're kind of still bouncing back from that. Um, and it is important, identification is so key because if we don't know who these kids are, we're not able to provide them with adequate support. And the whole point of the McKinney Vento Act is to remove barriers from those students seeking their education. So here in Montana, this is the number that we've got, again, from 2020-2021. Um, but pre-K through 12th grade, there are almost 5,000 students that were reported as living in one of those situations we just touched on. Um, and so that equals 3.2% of our total <coughs> enrollment um, in those public schools, which doesn't sound like a lot, but when you think about 5,000 kids, it kind of does, right? And then these are the last three years. So just to give you a breakdown of the type of living situation that we have, um, three quarters about of students are in that doubled up category that I mentioned. That is the most common. It's also the most common naturally in that fishery and housing. The only thing that's a little bit different for Montana compared to the national stats is that the one that's 10.7% there, that's unsheltered for Montana. Nationally, that number is a little bit smaller because Montana is just so rural and we just don't have those more populated areas than the nation has. Across the board, it's similar to the national. And we know education is important, right? So completing your high school degree is key. Um, experiencing homelessness is associated with an 87% likelihood, higher likelihood of dropping out being chronically absent from school, and also getting into trouble sometimes. As a world, you're angry at your circumstances. Um, so, so those are some of the things that we look for when we go to identify kiddos. Who's missing school? Who's getting into trouble? All right, and we know that it is important to complete high school because a lot of the jobs out there expect that that's, you know, their, their main criteria for you is that you have to at least have a high school diploma or a GED. Um, and so not having that diploma or GED increases your chances of experiencing homelessness as a young adult. 300% higher chances. That's astronomical. Make sure these kids are in school. And then this is our last big stat here. So over 4 million young adults between ages 14 to 24 unaccompanied homeless. So unaccompanied meaning that they are not with a legal parent or guardian. They're kind of out there just sending their So that's, that's pretty high. It was 1.1 million identified as homeless in our public schools, and then it shoots right up to 4 million for this age range here, and also they're unaccompanied. with them to guide the way. And one of the programs you've probably heard about, we were a recipient of a new exciting grant program from HUD. So that is the Youth Homelessness Demonstration Program. Um, and so it, the goal really is to provide a, to build a community approach to preventing and ending youth homelessness. And so Montana as a state was awarded 12 of these grants, kind of an experimental grant. And we were lucky enough to be one of those recipients. So 3.4 million overall for these projects across the state. The HARP program itself received 148,000, and so that's a two-year grant project. Um, and what we're really doing with that is opening and operating a drop-in center to serve that youth up to age 20. Kind of expanding. We're already serving K through 12, well, pre-K through 12, and now we're kind of going up into those older ages, maybe kind of reaching out to some of those kids that have dropped out or since graduated, but could really use some guidance in their young adult lives. And so it's a supportive services grant, and case management is the key service that we're providing. So we have been able to 
open a full-time case management position. Really exciting for us. And then this is just a map of where those YHDT grants are across the state. Where the little red dot on there, and then we have all, all our other sister grants. Yeah, this is pretty exciting. And they're not all the same type of grants. So some of them do provide housing. Um, like I said, ours is supportive services only. So what else do we have going on? It's probably been a while since you've heard from the HARP program. Um, so some things that we're changing up to try to improve identification. We did change the enrollment form. Um, we worked with our IT department to make sure that when students or families are enrolling, we are to change the language on how we're asking about that nighttime resident to make it a little less stigmatizing, but also more specific. So we can kind of narrow down are you sharing housing with someone else? Does the student sleep at grandma's house sometimes? Stepdad's house, you know, are, what's the nighttime situation looking like? So the language on that is way more inclusive than it has been previously. And so the enrollment form is one of the first ways that we can kind of catch. It's really important that we make it very best. And then as I explained, the Youth Homelessness Demonstration Program, so we are expanding to serve a little bit older age group which has been great. Um, that has really involved us a lot more with some of our community partners. So that's what I mean by the continuum of care. Those are the other service providers, homeless service providers in the area. So we are actually now a part of the state level and the local level continuum of care. So we really are one of the only organizations representing the voice of youth and family homelessness. So it's important that we are taking a seat at that table. And then of course, the main part of our presentation here, why we're all here, is the ambassador program. So our homeless programming for our students from the American Rescue Plan funding, we got two rounds of funding, which is just over $100,000. We did use a good chunk of change from that money to purchase a van, which is going to support transportation needs of our McKinney Mento and our YHCP uh, youth. And then we also are built, we built an ambassador program. So what that means is we have got some incredible staff, some in the room tonight, um, who have kind of just jumped on this opportunity to get a little more involved with what is McKinney Vento and how can we do a better job supporting these students that are absolutely in need, in need of adult support, in need of services. Um, and so you can see us all there, not all of us, but some of us, we, <laughs> We dressed up as tourists because this conference fell on Halloween. So we thought we were being cute and funny, and then no one else in the conference dressed up. <laughs> we were like, we don't usually dress like this. This is a costume. Uh, <laughs> but we had, we really had the best time, and our our staff that came along with us, the combination of counselors, <clears throat> paraeducators, teachers that have jumped on this opportunity to get more involved and to help us become stronger identifiers and supporters of these students. Um, so we learned all about McKinney Mental, McKinney Mental one-on-one. -on -one. We learned what other schools are doing across the nation. Um, and we came back with some really incredible ideas that we're excited to share and spread and just build that community in our schools and to have like, a local expert in each building, if that makes sense. So we're really excited about that program. We're using some of the funds to pay those staff outside of their contracted hours to do things like run attendance reports, because like I said, that's one of the years that a kid might be facing a transition. Um, so they're looking at attendance. They're looking at who's getting in trouble, right? So we talked about the behavior issue. Um, and then there's also an education piece to that. So they are responsible for helping educate the staff and faculty in their building, um, and so I provide support with where we where do we get that information? What should we be sending out to people? Are we going to staff meetings? Are we putting it in newsletters? Are we letting them know that you know, hey, be on the lookout for these kids. They do exist in our schools. Um, and here's the heart locker if we need additional help beyond that. And then just overall, so we're still doing all that good old stuff we've always done. We still have the heart locker where students can come and get free clothing, school supplies, hygiene stuff. And then we do have our little mini markets at the high schools. We're trying to do that in the middle school as well. Um, and the heart fund. So we use those monies to support students' immediate needs, whether they be extracurricular or whether it has to do with housing. If we have a family that's been chronically homeless, that finally finds a place and moving costs are a big 
barrier. We're provide one time assistance in cases like that. So we've built up quite a bit of fund that we can use for those. And then the youth and young adults drop in center, and last but not least, just being involved in the community, being really close with our partners, making sure that someone is coming to the table and, and has something to say about what our families do. All right. And then I think probably the most exciting part of our presentation is that we brought with us a former student. So Lizzie Lewis is going to just share with you a little bit of her experience and how the HEART program helped you support her in school. Hello, everybody. My name is Lizzie Lewis, and I'm here today to talk about a little bit how the Heart Walker has an impacted my life and how important I believe that it is. And to start off, I would like to say that I grew up in a very dysfunctional environment. Um, both of my parents were severely addicted. And the step-parents I eventually got in my life were also severely addicted. So there was a whole group of us kids in my family who grew up in a very dysfunctional, very chaotic environment. And so um, I basically, after everything happened, because um, we all went to foster care, so I went to foster care, and after I was foster care, I was bounced, bounced around from like house to house, and so I got lost in the system, and I slipped through the cracks, and I was allowed to go live back with my biological mother, <coughs> and her rights were terminated, so um, I don't know if it was politically correct, but my mom lived in a quote-unquote crack shack. <laughs> I don't know how else to say that, but... There was no running water, no electricity. Um, to take a shower. Um, it was very hard. And so my pure hatred for that lifestyle growing up um, drove me to enroll myself in the Linderman. And so I got myself into school, and I decided I wanted different for my life. And so I got myself a car, and I went to school, and oh gosh, And so I did myself. But it's also hard to go to school every day when you don't, you can't shower and you don't have running water and you don't have electricity. And that's where Winterman connected me to the heart doctor and they paid my bills. And oh gosh, I'm sorry, guys. They paid my bills so that I could go to school every day and so that I could go to school clean because who wants to really go to school when you don't smell great? And so um, I just wanted to talk to you guys about how I believe the Heart walker is very important because I am not unique. I'm not special. Every, <clears throat> almost all of my peers, almost all of my peers um, experience some type of like financial impact or um, this valley is very dysfunctional. So I believe that the heart walker um, is very important because they've helped a lot of my friends, and I know that as soon as my friends need help, the first place they can go is the Heart Walker. And um, yeah, that's basically all I'm say. <laughs> <laughs>
or from you know, a camper out the lakeside, you do absolutely everything you can to make sure transportation does not keep a kid from coming to school. Uh, we also make sure that they know they get free breakfast and lunch, so they're getting two free meals at school every single day. They don't have to pull the application out, they just get right on that list. Um, Immediate enrollment in school is another key one. So regardless of whether they have all of their paperwork or not, they have the right to immediately enroll in that school and start attending and participating just like any other kid. And then I would kind of come behind and help track down that paperwork if need be. Those are some of the key things that come with the Canadian system to make school easy, accessible, and hopefully one of the safe, stable places. And I do want to say, too, that was one of the things that I think we took from the conference was we had this incredible keynote speaker, um, and she put up these case studies, and she was telling us about this awful, horrible abuse this kid experience, and then she's like, yeah, 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 my career in education, 30 plus years, and then she puts up another case study, and then at the end of her presentation, we figure out she, the bulk of the case studies were her, and she's like, I became an educational professional, an education professional because School had always been my safe place. And so don't think that you're never making a difference. You're making a difference for whether you realize it or not. So that that message I think was one of the main ones, and you can tell me if I'm wrong. Um, but that's what stuck with us. So it is important to kind of there and be that person or know which person to connect the kid with. Did I answer Great. And more. Okay. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, two questions. First one with the age group up to 24, and you have a case manager for that. What is the situation that the case manager will be work, or what is the environment that the case manager will be working with those that are 19 to 24? Will it be on site where that person happens to be living, or will they come to the drop in center, or how does something like that work? In the first world, they will come to us. Uh, but since we've had our doors open, we haven't seen that traffic quite yet. We'll hopefully go to that point. Um, so it might need to look like that, kind of going out and one-on-one, um, -on -one, meeting the person where they're at. Sometimes can be an issue, work schedule can be an issue. Um, so I think the point is that we are providing the service, and where it happens is not necessarily the most but in those cases, I think it would make sense to have full staff members if it's not on site be at a public place. Secondary situation. And then the second question is, how's the drop-in center been working in the last couple of months? It's been slow. We're trying to, like I said, we're trying to build that up. Um, and I think we'll have to use some of the YGT funds to do some more intensive marketing to get the word out. Um, so that's the plan on that, and we'll be offering meals once we have some folks start to show up on a regular basis. So that might be a draw. Our washer and dryer is ready to go, so free laundry could be a draw as well. Um, there was another slot that I had that fluttered away. Thank you. <laughs> so much for your time. Just real quick. Yes, sir. Um, Lizzie, I just want to say thank you for coming and sharing your story. It was amazing. Um, it takes a lot of courage to get up and talk in front of us, so I appreciate that. Um, and I just want to say to the board, too, that if you have never been to the Hard Locker, you got to go. It is amazing. Um, I've been there and seen the students using it, and they got a smile on their face, and it is just amazing what you do there. So thank you very much. Thank you, Casey. Thank you, Lizzie. And Scott, thank you for those words, um, exact words I was going to say. It takes a lot of courage to come and talk to us sometimes. <laughs> okay, next up, uh, this is the, the time the board will allow 15 minutes for comment on public matters that are not on the main agenda. Members of the audience are encouraged to briefly address the trustees on an issue that is not on the agenda. 
I seek comments from the audience on significant items as they occur. Public matters do not include any pending legal matters, private personnel issues, or private student issues. Please do not attempt to address such issues at this time or you will be ruled out of order. Please note that individuals will be given three minutes for public comment. Is there anybody here who cares to make public comment tonight? We also allow public comment near the conclusion of our meeting. Seeing no one with public comment, we will move on to human resources and personnel items. Personnel action items. Mike, are you doing this one? I am. Thank you, Sue. So this is our customary list of hires, resignations, terminations, um, both for classified and certified, and also includes a new batch of people who have signed up to substitute teach in our district or substitute in some other capacity. Um, I will want, I do want to point out uh, everybody on this list is, is important, but there's someone who's really important to me, and that is Sherry Hodges-Ward, who is sitting up here with Andrea this evening. Sherry, say hello. Uh, and Sherry was hired as my new assistant, so I'm glad to have her. So we're looking for approval for Sherry and all the other people. <laughs> Please. <laughs> Any questions? So I'll make a uh, motion to approve the personal action items as presented. Thank you, Scott. Is there a second? Yes. Thank you, Heather. It's been moved and seconded. Any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passed unanimously. Thank you. Next up, special services request. Peterson, one year only para educator. Sarah? Hi, everybody. Um, so, this request is for a one year only para educator. Special service committee. Um, personally, we've had really, um, we just got high numbers in special ed over the board. We've a few times about this. Our numbers over the last couple of years have increased by a um, And so we're just, I think the reason I'm making a one year only request is here. You know, Sarah, I just have to make the comment then when we looked at the numbers over what the past four years or five years, it's incredible the increase in students on IEPs. Yeah. I'm surprised you're only asking for one for one year. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I set you up. You're right. <laughs> Yeah, I just want to be more, you know, instead of increasing care and thinking about the best way to maximize outcomes, I want to think long and hard about it increases, and so this will get us through this year and I'll as we think about your Any questions for Sarah? <coughs> you want to make a motion? 
Do I move to approve the request? Sarah, I see her Simone. Thank you, Lloyd. Oh, it no. isn't Peterson. It is elementary. Oh. Sorry. Thank you. Is there an element on the C who cares? <laughs> on them. <laughs> I move you. to approve. Thank you, Jennifer. <laughs> is there a second? Thank you, Lance. Um, it's been moved and seconded. Any other discussion? <laughs> so the only discussion I would have is didn't talk about it, but this does not affect the general fund at all. I always like to be able to point that out of our general fund. Thank you for that. Any other discussion? All in favor, please say aye. Elementary trustees, all in favor, <laughs> please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passed unanimously. <clears throat> Thank you, Sarah. Next up, high school baseball. Who's seat? So, um, in April, the board approved um, adding high school baseball to the, the stipend index um, with a rollout uh, starting the high school season in the spring of 2024. And so we've been working through that a little bit. And as we as we work through it, you know, one of the things that we're looking at is we're looking at our budget basically going into, into next year, knowing that right now that we have a budget shortfall. Um, you know, we just felt it wouldn't be prudent to add a stipend at, or a baseball at this time. We have the stipend, but it wouldn't be prudent to add, to add baseball. We're looking at, you know, probably about $100,000 in startup costs uh, between equipment, um, and then you take a look at the stipend. There's eighteen thousand dollars a year in, in stipend. So you know, in total, we're probably looking at about one hundred twenty thousand um, dollars in the first year, and then at least twenty thousand um, dollars continuing that. Didn't feel that you know if we're moving forward and we have a budget shortfall. Um, that you know, adding this, doing all the legwork, and you know, the reason why we're looking at it, you know, this far out um, is is part of the hiring process. It would start in in the spring. And that includes the ordering. That includes setting the schedule. Um, we also have, you know, um, overcoming some obstacles with finding uh, fields to be able to play on. It's not like you can go just walk in, play on a, a softball field. It's a little bit different with baseball. There's um, there's a little bit more involved uh, with that. We also looked at, you know, around the state. Uh, a lot of the AA schools are not adding it. In fact, there's only two AA schools. You know, at this time, they're going to start in 23, and that's uh, Butte and Belgrade. And, you know, we're talking with them. Um, actually, I believe Glendive is in, in Butte. You know, so there are some other eight schools out there that will be starting, but, you know, some of the travel time. Um, we just felt that, you know, we probably need to put this on hold, and that is our recommendation, you know, to put it on hold for the start of the 23-24 school year. So we can take a look, take a look at our budget, and just uh, make a – a better uh, recommendation based on our budget. And I, mean, I guess one thing I want to preface is, you know, at the, at the central office too, we're all about activities and giving, you know, students opportunities. And that is a tough decision when you're taking away opportunities. This was this was put out there for them, and then, you know, as we get into it and we create some excitement, then it's like, oh, you know, wait. So, so that's why we think, hey, it's not like we're we're dropping it, but let, let's put it on hold, study a little bit more, let's take a look a little bit more closely at some of our budgets before we move forward because I, I don't think you know it would be fair to all of our activity directors and everybody that we have involved to get everything going and then find out hey you know we can't really add this to the budget not only do we have to cut that but we have to look at cutting other things so our recommendation is to have a quick here thank you Pete questions comments I guess I have a question. So the Montana High School Association, the folks that kind of approved these things to go forward, I remember this happened with ladies wrestling and I think boys powerlifting. What consideration do they have for school trustees or school uh, school districts and, and high schools and, and their budgets uh, before they make a, 
recommendation like this of approving the new sport? Well, a lot of times, I'm sorry. A lot of times the recommendations will come from the schools in, you know, adding this. And so I imagine there's a lot of communities out there, you know, especially a lot of the smaller communities that they felt this was a great opportunity um, for students. And then when they do a vote at the Montana High School Association at their, you know, at their annual meeting, then it's a vote by all of the schools. And that's how that gets, a, so that's how that gets approved is through them. And they're the ones that are bringing it forward as a proposal. Um, to the Montana High School Association and then voted on by all of us. that answer that one? <clears throat> yeah, thank you. Yeah, and I, I would add to that, Lance, that they, uh, they try and study it. They usually try and put together a group to study it and look at some of those things, even, you know, adding shot clocks, um, which became very expensive for a double-A school district to add. Uh, you know, it wasn't like we just had one gym with two, two hoops on it uh, with the way that we split up courts and do all that kind of stuff. Um, I know like lacrosse is being considered, uh, that's going to be under review and study with the high school association. So there's a bit of a vetting process, but ultimately it's the membership schools and their administration that uh, that vote on that. So even if all the AA said no and all the rest of the schools said yes, it could still be a Thank you, Lance. Is there a second? Thank you, Heather. It's been moved and seconded. Any other discussion? I think it is prudent to put this off in light of the budget proposal. So thank you for you know making the recommendation and bringing it back up rather than just going forward with it. Any other discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passed unanimously. Wellness incentives. Uh, who's I'll let you. Thank you. But I'll, I'll, I got your back. I'll back you up. Okay. Okay. So, um, um, you know, we have a self-insurance plan, and the insurance committee uh, recently voted to request that um, we bring forward to you a request that the district offer up to a $100 incentive um, to each active plan participant who has an annual health assessment, and the acronym of that is AHA, uh, and a follow-up at the private health clinic uh, that we run. Um, they'll uh, decide a date later, um, and those active, those uh, that qualify for that are the active participant retirees, um, and those incentives would be paid from the self-insurance fund. Um, this was done in uh, 2021, uh, so you know they've done it before. Um, at that time, there were 562 active participants. About 340 of them, or 60 percent, actually participated. Uh, so they kind of like to run it through again. Um, it brings it's a, a preventative uh, health um, incentive to get folks in there and get get their blood drawn and and then have a follow up. Um, I think we had some discussion at the finance committee meeting that you wouldn't have to have your uh, service provider necessarily at the clinic. It's simply a blood draw. Um, and so it's lab work and then a follow-up and then the participant could take that to their um, their primary care physician um, for further, you know, uh, services from that person. So it's pretty much open to everyone participating. Yeah, and I would add to it. Um, that you know our our goal being self-funded is that we're running in the black and um, things that can uh, prevent us from doing that are illnesses or, or things that go undetected uh, for a long period of time. And it's far cheaper to treat and um, work with someone who maybe has a stage one cancer versus a stage four cancer. Um, and so the idea is that we're just trying to incentivize our, <clears throat> our workforce to go and get checked on regularly. Sometimes people look at that as a barrier. There's, you know, um, it's preventative health care. There's no copay. Uh, anything like that that's associated with it, but um, long term, what they see is 
you are saving your plan money <coughs> to detect, get things detected earlier. If you're having a conversation with a primary care about a variety of things, could be your cholesterol, could be your blood pressure, could be um, any of those kind of things. So, uh, in in general, we support the the concept. Um, and as we talked about it in finance committee, um, we <clears throat> kind of the question was, well, what's the motion? Um, and and keeping in mind that we still have a, a a fiscal responsibility to watch what's going on with our with our plan. Um, right now we're operating in the black, so so things are looking good for the second year in a row. Um, but we also want to be able to have the discretion to say, yeah, we can't afford to do you know up to one hundred dollars. Um, we could maybe do twenty five dollars this year, or we could put together a, a variety of different options for what that incentive looks like. So we're really asking the board to approve, you know really relying on Denise and, and our benefits manager and our, our consultant, Scott Haas, to uh, kind of put together a recommendation of what that looks like. This just gives us some guardrails around what that incentive is and, and for how much. Question. Mike. Yeah, Will. So are you saying that this $100 is like a top, that the actual program could be somewhere underneath that? Yes, absolutely. And that, you know, that's if you, you actually have to go get the blood work done and the follow up to be eligible for that incentive. And um, is there a kind of metric we have with something like ours that I should know? Yeah, that, that information is usually provided by um, Scott Haas, our consultant with USI, and they're the ones that look at, you know, the, the long term, you know, over the life of a plan. Um, how this type of preventative care is beneficial to financial stability of the and place. based on that he's recommending yeah yeah he recommended this years ago as well other questions comments So the recommended action on here, which would be the motion, is right before you on the agenda. Is anybody comfortable making that motion? Do I make a motion? Uh, move to allow the business director in consultation with the benefits manager and um, Scott Hosser, insurance consultant, to determine an incentive. Um, up to at the amount of and not to exceed $100 per participating employee for an annual health <laughs> Thank you, Diane. Is there a second? <clears throat> Thank you, Will. It's been moved and seconded. Any other discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passed unanimously. <coughs> Thank you. Next up, business contracts. Contracts for long-range facility plan study. You guys want me to take this one? <laughs> 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 yeah. All right, I'll take it. Get warmed up here. Um, so in the agenda, there's four attachments, and I asked Matt to pull up uh, kind of the primary um, document that is from a &E Design, uh, which is the firm that we selected uh, through an RFP process, RFQ process. Um, and what they've done is they've identified um, a series of tasks that they are going to complete based on the scope of the project that we're asking them to do. So uh, in really simple terms, one of the scopes is that a and &E will come in and will evaluate every room, every condition uh, from an architectural lens. So if they came in here, and saw that the ceilings were falling down and that the, the drywall had holes in it and the carpet needed to be replaced, anything that you could look at from an aesthetic uh, standpoint. So there's that. And we have 18 facilities in the district that um, we're asking them to uh, take a look at. So you have that component. You have a engineering component, which is Morrison Merrily, uh, and they are going to be looking at structural, mechanical, HVAC, and electrical uh, systems. And we'll be inventorying um, equipment and uh, and just overall um, kind of what they think a, a building may need. So they might walk around the exterior of the building 
and they see a big crack in the foundation, they're like, ah, oh, that needs to be fixed. Uh, they may see a sag in, um, in a window line or something like that, but they will start basically at the top uh, and work their way down. So we're going to have roof condition, um, and, and really what we're asking them to do is put together kind of a living document for us, not something that becomes a PDF and sits in a binder on a shelf, but something that we can use uh, and pinpoint here are things that we can do uh, long-range facility-wise uh, within our district. So we have buildings um, like Flathead that has been recently touched and, and updated, but there's still some older components to it. Um, and then we have buildings that were built in the 30s and 40s uh, that need uh, some additional care and attention. So there's that side of it. There's also a demographic report, um, and so they're hiring, and there's a scope of work in there for the demographer uh, that will be looking at uh, population trends, uh, birth rates, um, enrollment data for this, not only this district, but also for our outlying districts as well, because they feed into our high school district. Um, we'll be meeting with city and county planners, looking at build-out rates, um, new construction, you know, very much aware that we are the fastest growing micropolitan area uh, in the United States right now. So it's a, it's a big picture look at what do they project will happen uh, in Flathead Valley based off of the past 15, 20 year look back. Uh, and then looking forward. Um, there is also um, a component in here that involves our community. And what A&E will do will facilitate uh, two committees, one at the elementary and one at the high school level to look at what current existing facility structures have to offer, what is their utilization, what is their capacity, uh, and what is their educational adequacy. So it's a, it's a big heavy lift. Um, there's a lot of work uh, to be done in this. They feel comfortable with the timeline, um, you know, looking at that six to eight month range. Some things could go a little faster, some things could be slowed down, uh, but uh, <coughs> that is basically the, the big extent of the scope of, of this project. Um, they put together uh, in this document, and Matt, I think it's on the, oh, it's not on the scope. It's uh, um, last document, they basically put it together as an a la carte uh, type of menu where they said, okay, here is this facility, this is what we project based off of size and, and condition, uh, each one of those two aspects of the cost. Um, I think when you just, if you want to scroll down to the bottom line, um, you will see that the price tag is $333,160. So this is a... Um, very costly uh, endeavor uh, for our district, but I think looking forward to, you know, are we going to be building high schools, middle schools, elementary schools? Um, we need to have this this big lift done by a, a group that knows how to do that. We are looking for approval of this contract tonight, and I'm open to all sorts of questions. Heather, um, Micah, when you're talking about so we have this price tag, and mm -hmm. then the Morrison Merrily also. That includes, it includes that. Included yeah. Okay. So I think the, just the engineering side of this was $97,000. Uh, the um, uh, demographic study is $25,000. So that's all inclusive. Because the first time they sent it to me, it only had what A&E was responsible for. So I was like, oh, well, that seems pretty reasonable. <laughs> And they're like, oh, yeah, wait. <laughs> no, we, we got a couple other talks included in there. So there was a little bit of sticker shock for me. But um, one of the things that I communicated with uh, Brad and, and Shane uh, from A&E is that this is something that we really want to do right. We want to do well. This is a huge investment of, of, of resources, financial, from our district. Um, and this may not lead to a building, uh, but this may lead to uh, greater conversations because we're also trying to um, interweave what is transformational learning and advanced opportunities and competency-based learning. What, when we talk about what our educational model or philosophy is, how does that fit with what we have structurally? So it's a, it's a big conversation. So, <laughs> Mike, one of the efforts that the board is doing this year is to reach out to the partner schools. So when I'm out there uh, talking to the other boards, there's something from this project that we can 
promise or hand off to the um, we can promise them uh, a seat at the table if they want to be on a committee. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, um, you I'm know, I'm, once it's all over. Right. Well, once it's all over, everything we have would be a public document. And if there was anything that related to um, their district in terms of population and growth and those kind of things, I'm, sh I'm sure they could have access to that. They'll be there. Yep. Yeah. Uh, given the uh, melding of the physical structures with transformational learning and the environment that that might occur in, what kind of consulting firm are they going to be using to help address that, uh, especially since it's a new arena for all of us? Yeah, they actually have an educational consultant. Um, so when we first interviewed them, that person was not present. Uh, and I actually, before we made the final decision on who we were going to select, uh, Matt and Pete and I uh, sat down with uh, A&E and their educational consultants, the person that they would use to help drive that discussion. And so compared with uh, LPW, who has uh, access to the same things, you felt comfortable with them? Very. Okay. Thank you. Yep. You know, Will, I just wanted to respond to your question. If you, Matt, if you even scroll to the next page, um, it talks about the high school district, the planning process, and they talk about community meetings and prep time. So they're they're anticipating, you know, inviting the community to get some feedback on there. Uh, yeah, um, you said this is, these are estimates, right? So there's a chance it could be less, but how much of a chance is there that it's going to be a lot more? Well, it, it's not an estimate. Those would be the, the actual the cost, actual but cost. it's set up as a la carte. So if we looked at it and we said, you know, so one of our properties is the Birch Grove Community Center, um, which sits at the very south end of the runway at Glacier National Park International Airport. Um, and we lease that for five dollars a year to Birch Grove Community, and we may say, you know, we don't really need to do an analysis of, of that site. Is there a recommendation to hang on to it, to sell it, to dispose of it through surplus, uh, maybe something like that? So there's some there's a chance that you could reduce some of those costs um, in around that. But I think it'd be really good to know. I, I mean, I've never I've driven by it, but I've never been inside of it. Um, is it a good building? Is it a solid structure? Um, you know, so there's just bigger conversations around those kind of things. But um, uh, Rankin, you know, do we really need to do a, a condition inventory on a building that's five years old? Uh, maybe. Um, so we have we just have that flexibility. So those will be just part of the ongoing discussions that we have with A and E and Morrison Merrily. Other questions? Uh, what fund is this coming out of? I mean, do we have the resources for this? Yeah, we would be using the interlocal agreement fund to. Uh, um, how long does the study last? I mean, going forward, uh, it seems like a pretty hefty. Yeah. And, so. And as fast as our as fast as our valley is changing. Right. So, um, like the demographer is going to do a 15-year look out. So they'll do a, and I've seen some of his reports that he did for like the Billings District, Belgrade, um, you know, other fast-growing communities. And what they'll do is like a five-year, 10-year, 15-year projection um, on where they see, you know, by grade level uh, growth happening. Uh, so looking at that, you know, from that point. But I think, you know, the document that we're actually asking them to create uh, as an infinite longevity to it as long as it's continually updated and maintained. Uh, so, for example, if we said, uh, well, that's a good example. So, Hedges Roof, it's going to get replaced uh, this spring. So, they might come in and say, yeah, you need to replace the roof. Like, yeah, we got that. Here's how much it costs in today's dollars. Um, we can check it off, and, and it's got a 30 year warranty. So, now whatever board is around 30 years from now, I'll be like, yep, we have this document. Here's the things that we need to be thinking about.
out and looking ahead to uh, into the future. And if it's HVAC equipment, um, anything like that. I think the other thing that gets rolled into this, and we'll talk about it later tonight, is the security audit. Um, it's one of the things that need to happen with that too. So it, it's meant to be, we shouldn't need to really do this again for a long, long time. Other questions? So they'll come back and they'll make recommendations like, um, I don't think you really need to build another middle school, but I think you should build a shop that the middle school shop can move to, things like that. That's what we're looking for. Yeah, it, that could very well be one of the recommendations. And I almost see, um, you know, like a series, like, or you're going to decide on, on something, and it could be a compilation of we, we like this idea in plan one, we like this idea in plan two, because really, you're going to, you know, if it involves any type of building or construction, we have to go out to our voters and say, would you support this? Um, but we've also said, you know, like building a new school is, is really, you know, kind of a, a, a big deal for a, a firm and, and leading that process. But we may not be building a new school. We may say, you know, we could really repurpose some properties in and around Kalispell and do this, this, and this, Adam, based on what we've heard from, you know, what you want to do with transformational learning. Um, so really big ideas that it's not just about, hey, we're asking you to come in and tell us we need to build a high school. Um, we want to look at all options for our community. And, you know, when we did interview the firms, one of the, the big things we were looking for is the options that were available. I mean, it is ultimately up to us. They will present us with the information and then we will have to make the, the decisions on which path to move forward on. And, you know, we had talked, I know, earlier about we've got to start this process because the Valley is really growing. So when we interviewed them, I, I feel like we asked some pretty pertinent questions related to the options and the timeline. <laughs> yeah, I guess I just want to know that they have that like big picture thinking, right? Like that's what they're going to come in with, thinking outside the box. They have me with big picture thinking, so <laughs> <laughs> I help guide that. Any other questions or comments? $300,000 question. <laughs> Anybody comfortable making a motion? Do I move to approve the ME design long range facility plan? Thank you, Lance. I'll second that. <laughs> Thank you, Scott. Been moved and seconded. Any other discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Passed unanimously. Big Good. step. Thank you, everybody. We're excited about this, this next yeah. part of the process. And um, some of you will be asked to serve some time on a committee. <laughs> Not that you aren't already, but we got a new one. <laughs> OK, next up is our consent agenda. Let's do elementary <coughs> first. We got a couple things on there. Any questions? Elementary trustee willing to make a motion? Do I'll move that we approve the elementary consent? Thank you, Scott. Is there a second? Yeah. Thank you, Lance. It's been moved and seconded. Any other discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passed unanimously. Next, district-wide consent agenda. Any questions here? Comments? 
Does anyone want to make a motion? Thank you, Heather. Is there a second? Thank you, Lloyd. It's been moved and seconded. All in favor, Thank please you. say aye. 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 <laughs> Any opposed? Motion passed unanimously. Next up is our informational items and reports. We'll have trustee reports and then administrator reports. So we will start at far end. Lloyd. Watching kids debate, um, that's my favorite. So, I um, yeah, so it's really good. And then I also um, have a giving tree. It's not really like a trustee report, more like a work report. But I have a giving tree that I partnered with the Heart Locker with, um, and it's up at First Interstate. If anybody's interested, most of the tags there are for families um, at the Heart Locker. So it's things like um, gift cards for groceries, gift cards for gas things like that that they could really use. Um, so you can just leave them there at first interstate. I'll pick them up. No report. Um, at policy committee, we have started the arduous task, starting with the very first policy and reviewing them. And so we made it through the 1,000 1, series. Half. Half 1,000 oh. series. <laughs> <laughs> I had to leave early, I was hoping. <laughs> Policy. Yes. Um, most of those are governed by uh, MCA. Um, very little, very little for change. And a lot of them are coming back to the recommendation that maybe in 10 years they take a look at them again. So that's where we are. Thank you, Lance. The only thing I wanted to add is once again, sportsmanship. January 10th, right before our January 10th board meeting from four to six, we will have boardmanship. Put that on your calendars. Administrator reports. Who's going first? I will. Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> Start pulling your toe pull. <laughs> on there. Um, one thing brought to the, as an information item um, to the finance committee was the uh, traffic education vehicles. We have three 2019 uh, Camrys. Uh, the lease was actually up on on those in, in June. We did get an extension until um, December, so we went through and we crunched some numbers, looked at you know the options to either you know look for a new lease or uh, purchase them, and. Um, felt that it would probably be in our best interest to, to purchase those three vehicles, set them up on a six-year rotation. Um, there's, it's really hard to find an inventory out there right now, and the lease prices are running up. But besides that, so the residual on Jack is about $12,700 on each one of them. But we did take a look at the blue book value, and the blue book value is on the vehicles is between $22,000 and, and $24,000. So. Um, but we were, we're going to go ahead and move forward with uh, purchasing those. They do fall under the twenty-five thousand uh, dollars threshold, but just felt that um, it was important that we keep the board um, just informed on, on what we were doing with the traffic education. Thank you. Gotcha. Oh, one more thing. First, yes. somehow I I ended up with clocks. <laughs> So just a couple, I had, I had basically write this up a little bit, and and just full disclosure, you know, when Sue first presented, I 
you know, I was thrilled because I thought it was for the all the board members and you know <laughs> and everything behind it. And then I ended up with it, and I told Matt, "Boy, yeah, well, I should have paid attention to exact meaning, but it's, it's okay." So I said I was going to go through, but we're um, we're you know building that plane that we're flying. Yeah, I know, <laughs> you know on some of that, but um, you know, so as I as I thought about you know as I thought about this clock, you know, time is measured in in quantity and, and quality. And so my recipient for the clock spends both quantity and quality time um, at every single meeting. The uh, person is a great listener, asks great questions, acts as a filter, um, follows up when there needs to be clarification, and is a great asset to the district. Uh, you can find this person at every board meeting, committee meetings, school tours, celebrations, and, uh, and most importantly, developing relationships with uh, with our partner district. So I've really come to appreciate the amount of time this person spends gathering information and uh, making um, informed decisions. And so just a couple of, of quotes as, as I was kind of thinking about this a little bit. So this one's from, from William Blake, and it says, the hours of folly are measured by the clock, but of wisdom, no clock can measure. So I, I thought that was pretty good. And then, of course, you know, on the uh, activity side, a big activities guy, Kyrie Irving, he said, no, no alarm clock needed. My passion wakes me up. And so, um, Heather, so thank you for your wisdom and your passion in helping lead this district. So. Um, and then the other thing I wanted to report 
uh, about the election is that in May you passed a resolution asking the county election um, administrator to conduct the school election for this year. And I received a letter in the mail saying no. <laughs> um, they did list their reasons for that. They have limited staff. There's 23 school districts and a lot of districts split um, in, the, um, in the county. Uh, they feel that they have a small office. It would be overwhelming for them. Um, and they're, they're actually going through a, a, a new voter database software, I guess. So those are their reasons. Um, they did uh, offer up and identify those things that they would be assisting with. Some of those are the county election administrator's responsibility anyway in a district, such as maintaining the voter database, giving up the voter registration list, uh, checking the signatures on the um, ballots that are submitted back, you know, the verification form that you have to sign. They do all of that. Uh, they did offer us use of their ballot tabulating equipment this time, which would really save a lot of time for, you know, our elections. But that would mean um, purchasing and utilizing the required ballot stock, because, you know, now you're looking at ballot sets and you fill in the bubbles and things. So, um, I just wrote back and thanked them for their letter um, and just said, I'm going to need your help. So I'll be having meetings with them and move um, forward with it. Like that? All right. A uh, couple of quick things that were going on. Um, one, we're working with uh, the Office of Civil Rights. Uh, we had a complaint filed against the district for not having handicapped parking at Legend Stadium. Um, we don't actually have parking at Legend Stadium. It's all street <laughs> parking. Um, so we're kind of working through that a little bit um, on what we can do there. Uh, so I've had a couple of calls with uh, OCR and, and been looking at Google Earth and I've been showing them how, you know, there's county and city property and then private property. and and these are street accesses and things like that. So um, I'll keep you updated if there's uh, any changes there. Um, Lloyd uh, kind of helped remind me that, uh, just give you an update on lead and school water. Um, so keeping in mind that we are required to retest every three years, um, all of our facilities, and guess what? It's been three years in some of our facilities. Uh, and so we're going through that process. Uh, but we also had that grant um, for, Reducing lead in school waters, and we're looking at uh, Glacier High School, Flathead High School, and Hedges Elementary School um, as being the three schools that could be completed um, in the next few years um, with those grant dollars. So uh, things are, are moving along there. Um, lots of, of work being done. They're going to do some. It, it's kind of an interesting uh, process. You know, they draw 10 milliliters of water out of a fountain, and oh, shows lead. So they keep drawing until it doesn't show lead anymore. And so they can basically pinpoint based on the diameter of the the, the pipe and the, the amount of water that they've drawn out, you know, that, oh, there's a brass fitting or there's some fitting eight feet back in this wall that is your source of lead. Um, so it's a pretty extensive and, um, yeah, it's just it's a big project. And I know Greg's been working on it a little bit, um, trying to track down where all four water meters are at Flathead High School. Is, Quite a challenge. <laughs> in case you're wondering, there's one over in the auto shop. Um, and then uh, tonight, Michelle Payne is over at the city. Um, they are, uh, we got a notification that a group of residents have petitioned the city to expand the parking district around Flathead High School, um, which is challenging and problematic. Um, this one's a block uh, north and two blocks uh, west of Flathead High School, um, east of Flathead High School. And so, it's, again, that's a, a challenge for us. We have <clears throat> roughly 1,500 students, 160 staff members um, to find parking for. And, and if the parking district keeps being expanded out, we just keep pushing the, that parking further away, which from a high school administrator perspective is really challenging to supervise and monitor when there are issues out and about in the community. So the further it gets pushed away, the, 
the bigger the stretch is. So she's trying to appeal to the city council tonight to um, not approve that uh, increase in that in that district. And that's about all. Thank you, Micah. Next up, safe return to schools and continuity of service plans, which we're required to address every meeting. So we, yes, we are. But this time, um, we're going to be talking about the safe return to schools and continuity of service plan and the ARP ESSER plan. Uh, those actually have to be uh, board approved every six months. Uh, and so we're, hit, we're hitting that deadline of December to have it approved. And basically, once it's approved, um, there's a link on our website that we send to OPI and we say, here is the plan. Uh, same with the ARP ESSER plan that um, Denise is going to talk about here in just a minute. But uh, not a lot has changed um, in the plan. We've been operating under this plan uh, since last year. Um, we've added a couple of bullets and, and dates in there um, just to verify that we continue to see uh, very little activity in and around that. So we're just asking for approval of that tonight. Remove approval. Thank you, Jack. <laughs> Thank you, Lance. It's been moved and seconded. Any discussion? Questions? I would just point out if, if you're interested in reading it, um, it's only 15 pages, but at the bottom there's some links to the documents that we have uh, that supported that plan from its original creation uh, to present, and we've updated those links. Some of that document. I just have one question, Micah. I've been seeing a lot of reports uh, nationwide about children and flu and COVID at the same time. Do we see anything like that here? Is there anything yet? You know, it's nothing that I've been um, kind of any, had any kind of communication with the health department or anyone else around. Um, we know that there's a lot of sickness going around. Uh, we know that there are cases of, of COVID, but testing has been pretty low um, in Platted County in general. Um, and so it's hard to pinpoint what it is. And, and if there is testing, it might be home testing. And so maybe not documented for us. But yeah, there, we've definitely seen. Um, an uptick in absences with kids and staff. But we have heard of RSV, mm -hmm. uh, influenza, um, all sorts of stuff. I guess my concern would be children in the hospital. Yeah. Yeah, I have not heard anything. Um, I can certainly check on that, though. Okay. Any other questions? It's been moved and seconded. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passed unanimously. <clears throat> Next up is our second public comment time. Is there any? Well, we need to approve the ARP. Yes, sir. Oh, I'm sorry. It's an add in for this. This one isn't required to be on every month. Okay. So. <laughs> um, uh, the ARP ESSER plan uh, was submitted to the OPI um, in August of 2021, and then um, we're required to uh, review it and update it every six months. Um, and we are asking us to submit it our December board meeting. So we've reviewed the plan. It really remains unchanged in terms of, you know, the goals and the action plan and the coordinating funds um, are all kind of, they, they just haven't changed. What does need to be changed are just things like the school year that it applies to and then a staffing change from, uh, for the assistant superintendent, oh no, it's UP. <laughs> we need to replace Kelly's name with Peter's name. Uh, so, and then, um, you know, uh, we'll make those changes and, and post the updated document on our website. Thank you all for doing the tedious work.
Any questions? I move to approve the ESSER plan. Thank you, Jennifer. Is there a second? Thank you, Heather. It's been moved and seconded. Any further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passed unanimously. Now our second public comment. Is there anybody here for public comment? Okay. Seeing none, um, next up on the agenda, um, as board chair, um, I, um, it, I'm making the decision to move into executive session because it is necessary to maintain the security and integrity of secure facilities or information systems owned by or serving the state. So I would like to clear the room for the executive session and then we will reconvene into open session after we have our executive session. So. We're allowed to remain our school administrators and school board trustees. So could we adjourn for like four minutes? We need to do a little technology okay. transition. Okay. We will take a four minute break and get back at 7.35. <clears throat>